this series is meant to introduce to people, uh, individuals across Canada who are doing interesting things in the field of inclusive education. And uh, I'm Gordon Porter, Director of Inclusive Education Canada. And uh, I'm the host of the session along with my colleagues, Diane Richler, who's the chair of uh, Catalyst for Inclusive Education, a project of Inclusion International. And Diane's also a former executive vice president of what's now called Inclusion Canada, or the used to be the Canadian Association for Community Living. Diane has a lot of experience with inclusion, not only in Canada, but on a global basis. And our other colleague is Jackie Speck, who's uh, chair of the Canadian Research Centre on Inclusive Education at, London, at uh, Western University in London, Ontario. She's also a professor of education there and uh, has been coordinating the work of a couple of dozen uh, academics and researchers on inclusive education in the last few years. So the three of us are very happy to introduce to you and welcome as our guest today, Maria Hélène Desmarais, who's uh, currently a faculty member at the University of St. Boniface in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And uh, while she's originally from Quebec, she's been in uh, Winnipeg now for four years and has worked at uh, public school level, at the university level, and has a deep experience set in various uh, aspects of inclusive education. So welcome to our chat, Maria. Thank and you. Uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about what you're doing out in St. Boniface in uh, working in inclusive education? Yeah, of course. Um, so like you said, I'm, I've been working at the University of St. Boniface for the past four years. Um, I'm essentially a professor at master and post bac level. So I'm teaching teachers um, how to be more inclusive in their classroom. So that's mainly what I'm teaching about. Um, and as a researcher, I'm working mostly on universal design for learning in school and uh, on also well-being in school, well-being for teachers and well-being for students. Okay, now you, you've had experience in Quebec and now you're in Manitoba. What can you tell us about what's the same and what's different about what's happening in inclusive education in the two provinces? And of course, this is in the Francophone sector. Yes, of course. Um, I would say that Manitoba is way more inclusive than Quebec. Um, inclusion is in the law, uh, which is not the case in Quebec yet. Um, I'm saying that, but um, Quebec just kind of published a new policy on inclusion. And it's the first time that the word inclusion is included in the policy. So it's kind of a good news, I think. Um, but here in Manitoba, there is no special classes. Uh, and in Quebec, there still is. So I think it's it's completely a different way to, to approach things. And here when I'm going into school and I'm offering professional development day, um, I feel like teachers want to know how to do inclusive education. And they don't ask as often as it was when I was in Quebec why are we doing that? I feel that's like a, we are more convinced that the way we have to do things. And that's really a big difference, isn't it? Yes, it is. What, uh, why do you think uh, Quebec has been uh, relatively slow at taking an inclusive approach and putting it into policy and law? It's a Any hard thoughts question. On that? It's, it's a really hard question. I kind of don't, don't understand why, because every, everywhere else in Canada, inclusion is kind of the way to do, uh, to do things and to like to teach or are there, to try to. <laughs> are there still segregated schools, standalone segregated schools 
Yeah. For children with intellectual disabilities or other disabilities in Quebec? Yeah, there is. And um, I have to say that um, my brother who has Down syndrome uh, did all his, like all his school was in a segregated class and school. It was really a special school only for students who had um, intellectual disability. And that's uh, in Montreal? That's in Quebec. Oh, right, in Quebec. Yeah. And uh, so all this school was really in a special school. Um, it worked well for him, I have to say. He had friends and it was a great context for him. Um, and it was better because like, I think the first year of school, my parents sent him in a regular school and he was the only one. And he was the first one at that school and that went really bad. It was bad for him, it was bad for me. Um, as well, well, I guess because... that, that gets at the point that <laughs> inclusion isn't really inclusion if it's not well supported. Exactly. That was not inclusion. He was the only one. He had someone with him all the time and like his schedule were different. And so it was not good for him. It was not good for his teacher, I have to say, because she was kind of that was the first time she had a, a child like my brother and she didn't know what to do. Like she was super nice, but she just didn't know what to do. And I assume she didn't get any support. Exactly. Yeah. So tell me, how did you, like, you now believe that inclusive education is the way to go, am I right? Tell us, yeah. tell us how you came to that view. Um, I have to, to be honest with you, I, I kind of struggle with that idea for quite a bit um, because I saw that my brother was, well, not in inclusion, right? So, and I saw the trouble we had in a regular school. Right. And then I realized that what I what my brother was experiencing in a real in a regular school was not inclusion. So when I understood better what inclusion was, it's kind of where I begin to think that that might be the way to do things. Can you talk and, about that a bit more? Like why, what what made that debate go on in your mind that? what had happened that that there was something called inclusion and it wasn't what had happened for your brother and maybe that would have been good just like what what made you think that because what i saw from my brother was like he was excluded it was not inclusion people were telling him that he was included in the classroom but basically he was just like put there but, with but no why support did you, but, but why did you just think segregation is good what made you want to pursue knowing more about inclusion? Um, I met Nadia Rousseau, first of all, when I was like one of her students and she was talking about inclusion and she was really like convincing. And I remember I was following her, one of her class and at the same time, I was being a resource teacher in CEGEP in Quebec. So, so that's community college. Yeah, exactly. So. I was helping my students who were mostly um, having dyslexia. So I was helping them and I was like alone in my office with them working super hard to help them read and write better. And then they were going into their classes and they could not do anything of what I was showing them to do because the class didn't accept them to have a computer or you know what I mean? So in my office, it was going so well with them, but with their teachers, nothing was happening. So I was like, I'm working for nothing right now. I feel like I'm not helping my student and I'm work working super hard to do it, but it's not working because the classroom is not doing the same as I'm doing with them. So that's kind of where all those thoughts came back to me. And at the same time, I was following that class with Nadia and I realized that, oh, if everybody are working the same way, maybe it's gonna be more efficient. I know it sounds super easy to say, but that's kind of the, the, the I don't know if I can say mm -hmm. that, but that's kind of the, the thing that was missing in my head, like kind of a, and then I realized that I need to work more with the teachers to show them how to do inclusion. And that way, students will will succeed better. So that's 
kind of how I came to this whole reflection. And that's why I choose to work on universal design for learning as well. And for my brother, I think that um, if we had the support that we needed, I think he would be great in a regular class. So you're working on universal design for learning um, at the university level, as well as the K to 12 level? Yes, yeah. my PhD was on university and now I'm working K to 12. And so what did you find um, perhaps most interesting or, or thoughtful about dealing with universal design for learning in the university system, right? Because I think we still find it difficult enough in the K to 12 system, but the university system seems to be one of those nuts to crack still. Because if you need help in any way, there's, you don't belong here, right? That's the feeling I get from speaking to a lot of people in yeah. the university system. So what were some interesting findings? about how um, to support UDL in university? What I, one of the things that I, that came from my PhD was when prof, when professors understand what UDL is, they are more confident in teaching to diverse students because they get that you're not like reducing your, um, your goal Mm -hmm. or your standard you're just doing things a little bit differently and once you realize that your students are learning it's kind of a motivation for a prof right so that is something that I was a little bit surprised um and also can you, can you give an example from a university level course because I have to admit that I find it hard to think about how to apply UDL at a university level? I can talk about my own classes because maybe, because obviously if I'm saying that I'm a specialist in UDL, that's how I teach, right? <laughs> I would not be a good model if I didn't <laughs> do it this way. Um, so I, I do a couple of things. Um, some are super simple and some are a little bit more complicated. Um, I enter all my classroom with a little cart and in that card, there is everything a student might need in my class. So there is pencils, there is, there is even snacks, there is like a blanket if you get cold, there is a cell phone charger, there is, you know, all those things that are not in link with my class, but if you don't have, you may be distracted. So I just roll it with me when I come into class and I told my student, if you need something, just get up and come. Another simple thing that I do, which might sound really, really simple, is sit the way you want. If you want to sit on the table, sit on the table. If you want to walk in the back of the classroom while I'm talking, do it. If you want to come in the front and sit and sit on the ground, you can do it. I don't care about that. Just find a way that you are going to be able to listen to me and do it. So those things are not really complicated, right? But also what I'm doing is often I'm gonna choose the evaluation or the, the homeworks or like the assignment with my student in, at the first class. I'm gonna tell them, here's what I wanna do, is, here's what I want you to learn this semester. How do you think I, I should evaluate you? And we discuss it and we, we even build the criteria together and they choose like how much is worth like they choose if it's a 50 percent assignment or 10 or 40 they choose if you, they want to do it uh, by their own or in themes um, they also choose um, the subject the way they is it going to be like something that they can talk to me about or it's going to be a written task so they choose all of it so that seems like I, you know i'm thinking about some of the people i think of from from kindergarten to university like that's giving over a lot of control to the students yeah how do you help people feel comfortable with doing that with trusting the learner in terms yeah. of that process um 
there's something in the, the theory of universal design for learning, which is called the expert learner. And it's all about self-regulation. So it's to show students how to make good choice for them. At a university level, um, what I do is I'm gonna, t I'm gonna often show example to them, like saying last year, the student did this and they did that for that reason. And they said that this was great and this was less great. So I'm gonna explain to them and I'm also gonna guide their choice. I'm gonna say, okay, that's okay if you can do, if you wanna do something, but remember that I still need this. So it's not like do whatever you want. I'm more like, okay, this is like the things that we need to reach. Do you think we can reach all those things with the choice you made? If you say no, we need to discuss more. Great. So I'm kind of there making sure that uh, everything is on track. Um, but I have to say that the first time I did that, and I would say that probably each my first class, I have some students who experience uh, anxiety because mm -hmm. it's the first time that a professor has them so many questions about what to do. And for some of them, it's super hard. Yeah. And, and what about evaluation? I mean, you have to submit marks to the university. How do you do that? And um, how do you compare the results among students to know, uh, you know who's going to get the A and who's going to get the B? Because we choose the criteria together, I'm still able to mark them as a normal task. It's just that they are choosing what the A plus means. Mm -hmm. And then, and of course I'm choosing with them, right? I'm not yes. saying like, right? It's not like but all apples and unicorns, but um, so I'm choosing with them and uh, I never had a problem with my syllabus hmm. until now. <laughs> so, so you're clear. You're clear on what uh, the outcomes are. Exactly. But you're flexible about how you go from where they are to where they need to go. When I can, because yeah. I, I'm teaching a class on um, introductory to research. And in that class, for example, they have to learn how to do APA references. For that, I cannot be flex flexible, right? There, that's right. a norm and you have to submit it. And I have to check if you put the dot and the everything at the right place right so when I can be flexible I'm I'm being the more flexible I can so can you reflect a little bit about uh, school leadership and your experience with school leaders and maybe both in Quebec and in Manitoba what what's been your experience with uh, let's say people at the uh, I'll call it school board level but it's just you know the the local education authority that provide the leadership for individual schools. What's your experience with that? I don't have many experience in that in Quebec, so I can speak a little bit more in Manitoba. And here I'm more um, active in the francophone ones, right? Um, in the francophone sector. But what I would have to say about that is if the leadership is like, wants to collaborate, listen teachers, and but also provide a vision. Like if inclusive education is not a choice and that is clear and it's, we're going to support you. We're going to teach you how to do it. We're going to give you a resource. It works. But if you say, do whatever you want, that's not working. And what about at the school level? Um, I think it's a little bit the same. Like you mean like the leadership in the school? Right. Um, I think it's the same. And it's also, um, I'm following a school right now where we are, and it's a one year project. So I'm in the school like every month. It's on Zoom because of COVID, but still. Um, so I'm following those teachers and the the leadership of the school said to those teacher okay i'm gonna give you the time to train in universal design for learning with marie and 
Um, she's going to come and do a lot of PD day, you know, professional development day um, during the year. And, and so everything, like all the planning of the school for this year is about universal design for learning. So even the teacher who are not in the research project are kind of seeing me every two months. So that is the decision from the leadership. And it works because it's Korean and it's, it's, they, are, they feel supported and they choose that as a school as well. It's not just the leadership who say, okay, we are going to do that. So to me, it's, it's again, having a vision, supporting, explaining why and, and listen what teacher has to say. What about involvement of parents in, in Manitoba Francophone schools? Are they, you know, there, it's certainly a minority, right? The majority population is English. Yeah. So does that mean they have a strong sense of community? Are, are parents very closely connected with teachers and principals in their local school? Is there a lot of back and forth and uh, mutual uh, exchange of ideas and partnership between parents and, and um, educators? There is, but I would, I would, I feel like it's the same as everywhere. It's and and for some school here, like the school I'm following right now, um, most of the students are from non-French family. Um, they are immigrants. Uh, so often the parents are not speaking French, so it's hard to collaborate with them when they are not understanding the language, right? So that's, that's a challenge that's happening a lot here. And so in immersion, it's, it's, it's the same. So in, uh, children of English speaking parents choose to go to the Francophone school? Sometimes they do. It's not like the main uh, it's more like immigrants from, I don't know, like Africa or um, I'm looking for the Syria or like right. Asian countries. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So those can come. Um, yeah. And if one of the parents was in school in French, when little, they can send their child in French. Okay. Um, but they might have lost their friends, right? Right. Okay. Gordon, I'm afraid that our time will run out before I ask my burning question to <laughs> Mary Ellen. <laughs> and I'm sorry, yeah. I spoke too much. <laughs> no, you didn't at all. It's fascinating. And I, a half hour is not going to be enough to ask, <laughs> uh, ask you everything. I, I think your approach to teaching just sounds fantastic. But I know that you've also um, done work on um, denormalization. And as someone who was around and involved uh, in the Canadian scene when the concept of normalization was first introduced and was such a challenge to the way of doing things when there was no thought of inclusive education, most kids with intellectual disabilities didn't go to school at all. Uh, institutions were the only option available for families. So what is denormalization and what can we learn from it? Um, what is denormalization is a way to see the system and not just the school, like the society, in a way that there is no norm. It's kind of broken the norm. So it sounds a little bit weird, but it's kind of a way to see that the difference and the fact that everybody is truly different and unique is the norm. And it's that would help inclusive education for sure, because there is no norm that you have to refer to. So you're not that, teaching for the average student? Exactly. There's no average student? There is no average student. There is just students. So that is the idea behind denormalization. And that's why I like it a little bit better than even the social role of normalization, because mm -hmm. the idea of the norm is still there. Right. And the idea of finding a way to help one student is still there. And of course we have to help students. That's not what I mean, but it's how can we teach to everybody? And 
from what we learn, even about neurosciences, we know that everybody learns differently. Even if you are super smart, you learn differently and you learn things differently from day to day, from what you are learning. So you can learn math from a way and then French or English in another way. So that's the so end. It's, if I get this right, you tell me. It's a, instead of accommodating diversity, you embrace diversity. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. How'd she do, Diane? Uh, I'm in. I mean, I think <laughs> I think that's terrific. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that um, you know, so many teachers are still operating where this is the curriculum and this is what everyone has to do. And so if some kids are struggling with it and some kids are bored with it, there's there's no way to get around that. So I think your approach really has has a lot of uh, a lot of benefit. Yes, and I think it's the main challenge right now with inclusive education because the system is still in the norm. So that's <clears throat> that's quite a compliment, Maria Lamb, because Diane helped Wolf Wolfensberger edit and finish the book Normalization way back when, even though you can't tell she's still very young. <laughs> Jackie, how about you? Do you have another question? Our time's almost up. Well, I, yeah, I, I mean, I think along that, that same lines, right? I mean, it, it seemed to make sense a long time ago to say, you know, we belong. So we're not really different. We belong. And I think that was the whole point of normalization, that you are right. who you are and you belong. But I agree that we've now come to this point where in, somehow in our minds, we think that for inclusion to happen, everybody has to be treated the same and do the same things and we have to throw that away because that's that's not going to work right and it should be about who you are belongs whatever that difference is that diversity um, we get away from the word di difference because that still implies there's norm um, but that, right. that we exist on continuum and and so we just embrace embrace, embrace all learning so i yeah, very excited to see how your work goes with that, Marilyn. So I think that some of the, sorry. No, go ahead. Okay, I think that's um, some of the work that you did probably at the post-secondary level involved use of um, assistive technologies. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit, and, and maybe you've done that at the K to 12 level too, but I'm just wondering about how you've seen supporting teachers and supporting learners when they may need a technology that's different from what others in the class are using? Um, again, that's where <laughs> I became, I would say, in love with UDL. It's when I realized that if you, you give assistive technology to everybody in the classroom, people who really need it will use it. Because one of the main challenge when I was working on that in Quebec is when you are a high school student and you are the only one in your classroom who has a, a computer in front of you, you don't want to use that computer because it's telling everybody that you're different. So you rather fail your class than using what you need to succeed. And that was the main challenge with assistive technology. They, they don't want to use it. Okay, with that, that's the last word. Uh... <laughs> Maria Lam, thank you for joining us. Uh, remind people that uh, Maria Lam is one of our associates with uh, Inclusive Education Canada, and you can find her uh, page on our website under uh, Associates link and see some of the things she's done and some of the publications that she's produced. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we thank you and goodbye. Mm -hmm.